Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Uh, the city of Baldur's Gate has always been one of my absolute favorite locations in the entirety of the Forgotten Realms setting. Uh, any campaigns that I've run using the Forgotten Realms have, for the most part at one point or another, taken place uh, or had the player characters visit the city. A lot of times I tend to begin my campaigns in there, like I did with my Horde of the Dragon Queen uh, campaign that I ran for a few months. Um, so. I just always really enjoyed that city, and to me it's, again, my personal favorite, even over places like Waterdeep, which I know a lot of people really love. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I enjoyed playing the computer games, even though I wasn't very good at them. Uh, I enjoyed the Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance home console games, which I thought were really great. Um, and I just really wanted to see Baldur's Gate get the kind of attention that uh, Waterdeep got, for, especially when 3rd edition was releasing tons of location supplements. So I was a bit dismayed that never really happened. Now, as it turns out, years later, uh, during the period of time in which Wizards of the Coast was doing the D&D Next playtest, uh, Wizards of the Coast did actually release a product that focuses very specifically on Baldur's Gate. And that is the adventure slash supplement uh, Murder in Baldur's Gate. Now, a little bit of backstory about this is it came out during a point in time in which I considered myself to be done with buying Dungeons & Dragons stuff. Uh, I had 1st uh, edition AD&D stuff, I had 2nd edition 3rd, 3.5, 4th, and D&D Essentials, and I had just recently spent a lot of money and time building up my 4th edition collection. So at this point I considered myself done. I wasn't really interested in the playtest. Um, you know, based off what I heard, it was uh, initially touted as being an edition that would allow you to incorporate elements of whichever one you preferred that came before it. And if I really wanted to do that, then I had all the previous editions. So I really didn't focus on anything that was going on at the time. And this also released around a point in time in which I was uh, in the process of looking to move and start a new life for myself in a different town uh, with my fiance. So for years and years, I actually forgot that this existed. Um, until recently, when I had the option to finally pick it up, thanks in large part to my awesome uh, Patreon followers. So what I want to do with this video is kind of do a review or an overview of the adventure and give sort of my final thoughts on this product. So before I begin my actual overview or review of the product, I think it's important just to kind of once again go over what's inside of this product. I did do an unboxing video when I first got it, opened it up and showed everything off. But that's, a, again, that's a separate video. It was done a little while ago. So what I'm going to do is just basically go over that again, show off the contents, and then we'll get into sort of like the meat and potatoes of the product itself. So the first thing is it's contained within this paper sleeve, which comes off. Now, um, this is really thin kind of flimsy paper and something that I believe would probably be quite prone to damage. So I'm a little bit hesitant to actually set this on a shelf. I kind of just want to have it laying down because I don't want it to be, you know, ripped or torn just when I'm trying to slide it. So uh, this is kind of like a flimsy, not the greatest part of the of the product, but again, you know, it serves the purpose of at least having something to kind of cover it over. Uh, inside of that sleeve, we have a DM screen as well as uh, two uh, paperback booklets. So we'll get to the booklets in a moment, but let's have a look at the screen first. So the DM screen. Uh, actually brilliantly details the city of Baldur's Gate. So the, the side facing out uh, that the players are going to see while you're running this adventure has uh, a map of the city itself. Um, so you've got like the upper city, the lower city, as well as the outer city and other important locations like Worms Rock, um, which is sort of like the prison slash where um, the uh, Flaming Fist operates out of. And in addition to having the map itself, it does actually show uh, zoomed in details of some of the important locations that the player characters will be traveling to. So even though it doesn't have like the most highly detailed like maps of like the interiors or stuff like that, you know, when you tell the player characters that they're in the wide, for example, they can kind of get an idea of what it looks like just based off of that. Um, so we've got like, so that's just a really nice amount of detail. Uh, love this screen. Uh, the outside panels just have some of like the important NPCs that the player characters may come across, as well as kind of important locations. So again, we've got Worms Rock, that's important to the Flaming Fist. Uh, we have the um, coat of arms for the city of Baldur's Gate itself. And on this one, we have what I believe is a little Kalimshin which is part of the outer city, which is one of the more lawless areas. Uh, the emblem of the Flaming Fist, and again, just a couple of the NPCs. Now, on the inside of the screen, we have 
again, more maps, which is uh, fantastic. This map I absolutely love. And what it does is it actually uh, shows a lot of the important locations and actually categorizes them. So if you look off to the side here, you've got things like government buildings, city gates, shops and businesses, uh, temples and shrines, uh, taverns, inns, fest halls, or feast halls, and cafes, districts, statues, which is really cool, and uh, other notable locations. So this is a, a massively important uh, map for anybody running adventures that take place in Baldur's Gate. And this is useful beyond just the scope of this adventure. If you want to use Baldur's Gate as sort of like a hub world or a base of operations, however you want to look at it, this is almost invaluable. This is so, so great. And then we have, you know, again, just some more stuff over here as well, which are the different districts that you have. And uh, on the far panels, we have uh, just some random information that you can use to kind of flesh out the adventure. Um, so there's going to be points where there are some down periods between events that take place in the adventure as written. So this allows you to kind of, again, just fill it out and let the player characters kind of do their own thing, but get the sense that there is this, you know, vast and well-made-out uh, city. So you've got things like, for example, uh, shop names that you can come up with at random if you wish. Uh, shop functions, you know, where you can kind of find them. And then finally, just a thing for random NPC names, which if you're somebody like myself, I am awful with trying to come up with names. I mean, I'm terrible with using names in, in real life. Uh, so I love the idea of having something like this. Um, I think that's great. And then on the far side, we have just the other far side, we have uh, random encounters, as well as ranks of the watch, flaming fist, and ranks of the guild. So these are the three organizations that the player characters are going to be interacting with throughout the uh, the adventure and more likely than not we'll be actively working for one of these three groups so that's the uh, the DM screen we're just gonna actually why don't we just kinda set this up in the background here alright so that is the screen itself I'm just gonna tilt this down so other than that we have uh, the adventure booklet which we'll get to momentarily just a little advertisement insert which I always like to keep and then we've got the campaign guide. So this is a 63 page booklet that's all about uh, the city of Baldur's Gate and it fleshes it out wonderfully. If you wanted to have a write up on the city, including things like the governmental structure, uh, you know, important businesses, locations, notable uh, figures and things like that, this is absolutely uh, amazing. Uh, it also comes with some maps detailing inside of certain locations like the High Hall and, uh, you know, the Undercellar here, which is a uh, sort of a network, a sewer network that the uh, uh, things like Thieves Guild and people of less than reputable uh, means kind of use to move around without being noticed. One of my favorite things that this has is uh, a statue of the beloved ranger and if you've played the computer game at all then you know uh, who this is and the fact of the matter is that you actually get a statue of Minsk and Boo which are my favorite characters from the computer games. Uh, the statue itself looks really great. I love that they included the art of it in here and what's also really cool is that this does actually take place, or this is actually used, in the adventure itself. So something happens to the statue and the player characters have the potential uh, to investigate it. So that is, again, really cool. But other than that, this book is just a hugely useful resource under, uh, for the, sorry, not under, but about the city of Baldur's Gate. Uh, so it's just, again, just a really awesome uh, book filled with all kinds of great information. You know, it has the, the, the history of, of Baldur's Gate. Uh, it has things like information on like a day in Baldur's Gate, so kind of what a typical day might look like, what a typical night may look like. Uh, again, it has the history, and it does reference the video games because the computer games are considered canon as far as this adventure is concerned. So it goes over the things like with um, Saravok, uh, the main villain from the first Baldur's Gate, uh, you know, the Iron Throne and their attempt to overthrow the city, and how they were defeated by the main protagonist of the computer game, who is actually given a specific identity as uh, um, uh, Abdel Adrian, so one of the, the ball spawn. 
Uh, so again, like I said, this, this is just a really great, uh, fantastic uh, wealth of information that is useful, again, beyond just the adventure. So if you want to, again, use Baldur's Gate as a major location, this will allow you to flesh it out to its highest potential. Now, uh, one of the things that I had mentioned in past videos is uh, a Q&A session that I attended where R.A. Salvatore had mentioned that uh, the 5th edition uh, Forgotten Realms campaign was going to be developed by the authors. Now, a campaign setting hadn't been released to this point, but this adventure itself is developed by uh, Ed Greenwood, uh, Matt Cernet, and Steve Winter, who are um, you know authors that have written books that take place in the Forgotten Realms. So if you want some of that information, these are the products that you're going to actually get them out of. Unfortunately, there's only the two of them that have come out at this point in time. But again, this is just a really fantastic product. So, with that out of the way, the last thing we're going to look at is the adventure itself. Uh, the adventure itself is presented in this 32-page booklet, and the basic premise or the story behind it uh, has it as a spiritual successor to the Baldur's Gate computer games. Now, if you haven't played the computer games, or it's been a while and you're kind of fuzzy on the story, uh, this one really follows the events more or less of the first game. Um, the idea was that during an event over a century ago known as the Time of Troubles, a period of time in which the gods were cast out of their divine realms and forced to walk the earth as mortals, um, one god in particular, the god of murder, Baal, actually foresaw his own death and wanted to find ways to bring himself back once that uh, event took place. To do so, he went around and impregnated uh, several women of various races all throughout the Western Heartlands region. Uh, each of the children that were produced as, this, as a result of this carried a small amount of Baal's divine energy. As they matured, it would manifest it in a desire to seek out any of these other children, referred to as the Baal spawn after that, uh, seeking them out, murdering them in an attempt to become basically the new god of murder. Um, as the, camp, as the computer game plays out, you play uh, one of these ball spawn, and you get to make whatever character that you wish, uh, but you end up confronting this villain known as Saravok, who's trying to overturn or overthrow the leadership of Baldur's Gate, and in, ex in turn, you know, wants to kill as many people as he can to, again, release the god of murder. As the player character, you end up overthrowing this and defeating uh, Saravok and thwarting these plans. Uh, now, this adventure actually canonizes the identity of the player character from the computer game as a human male known as um, Abdul Adrian, who, after ad completing his adventuring life, retires to Baldur's Gate and actually ends up becoming not only the leader of the uh, Flaming Fist, but serving on the Council of Peers a, um, uh, as one of the, main, the, one of the four main dukes uh, that's in charge of overseeing uh, the city itself, so coming up with laws, passing them, things like that. So he's actually a very high-ranking uh, official. Um, and he's been around for so long because of the divine energy in him that people just kind of expect him to be there. Uh, and a lot of people have actually forgotten a lot of the details about what happened over a century ago. Uh, everybody thinking him, you know, to be the last of the ball spawn, but that's not the case. Another individual by the name of Vaking is actually another one of the ball spawn, and he went around eliminating any and all of the rest of the remaining ball spawn with the exception of Abdul Adrian, leaving the two of them as the final two of these ball spawns on Faerun. Um, as the adventure begins, the player characters are taking part in a festival in which Abdul Adrian is about to uh, make a public speech uh, for the people in this like large marketplace known as the Wide. Uh, as this happens, he is armored but unarmed, and confronted at this point by Vaking, who rushes the stage in an attempt to assassinate him. The player characters have the opportunity to intervene, but it could be made difficult by the fact that they're trying to shove their way through a now panicked crowd, uh, and you could also have things such as uh, mercenaries working with Vaking, uh, attacking uh, citizens as well, making it difficult for the player characters to get through, because they may want to end up helping the citizens first before this, you know, uh, well-experienced adventurer. Um, there is a chance that Abdul Adrian may end up or being the victor. Uh, what happens is basically you roll, the DM rolls two different dice, a d10 for Vaking where he's armed, and a d6 for Abdul Adrian. If one of these individuals rolls two or more on their dice higher than the other, that individual kills the other. Now what happens is when this last remaining ball spawn is killed, 
the god ball is actually quietly um, resurrected. Also, when this happens, the survivor of the encounter goes on, undergoes this horrific transformation into this large creature known as a ball spawn slayer. The player characters are then, at this point, able to intervene and uh, help defeat the ball spawn slayer. Uh, so as this happens, everybody is reminded of the events that took place. They you know, are aware that he was one of the ball spawn, but they believe that by the player characters defeating him, it actually prevented Ball from being resurrected. This didn't actually occur. Ball has been returned, albeit in a weakened state. Now, at this point in time, the player characters are eventually approached by three separate individuals um, looking to recruit them for their own causes. Uh, these individuals are uh, Torlin Silvershield, who is a noble of the upper city, uh, Rilsa Rael, who is uh, a representative of an entity known as simply as the Guild, a thieves' guild that operates in the outer city, as well as Aldred Ravengard, who is the new leader of the Flaming Fist, and who operates primarily in the lower city. Uh, the player characters are asked to meet with all three of these individuals, uh, but based on the timing and when these events take place, we'll likely only be able to meet with one, possibly two of these individuals. Uh, the player characters then choose which of these three to kind of uh, fall into the employ of, and which one they get sent on uh, quests for. So as the player characters choose which of these three individuals to work for, uh, something that's happening in the background is the god ball is trying to find his new chosen and he doesn't have the power to immediately make that choice known so he decides to slowly corrupt each of these three individuals that the player characters may end up working for. Uh, the rest of the adventure takes place in a series of stages, with ten stages working out overall. In each stage, uh, one to three events take place simultaneously, and the player characters have to choose how to interact with each of these situations. A few of these uh, stages are just a single event, giving the player characters more opportunity to affect the overall story. But as as things go on and as events unfold, uh, Ball or the three individuals, um, Silver Shield, uh, Ravengard, and uh, Rael, uh, start to earn favor of the god Ball. So as each event takes place, you, the DM has to track the outcomes, and the outcomes to dictate which individual starts earning ranks in Ball's favor. So the way that these events unfold is they all take place more or less simultaneously, meaning that the player characters are not likely to be able to intervene in all of these events. However, their interjection or lack of interjection can ad advance uh, the ranks and the favors of each of these individuals. For example, uh, Rael um, wants to uh, has an event where she wishes to uh, rob one of the tax collectors in the city. If the player characters uh, take part in that and you know engage in this event, or if they have nothing to do with it whatsoever, then Rael ends up gaining a rank in Ball's favor. If the player characters uh, are not involved directly, are not sent to uh, attack the tax collector and steal his gold, uh, they may see the attackers um, move in on this individual. If the player characters intervene and prevent the tax collector from being robbed, then Rael does not gain a rank in Ball's favor. Now, I don't really want to go over all the individual events that take place, because there's a lot to do, and I don't want to make this into like an hour-long video. So, what I really want to do is just kind of talk about the three um, potential antagonists, and their overarching plots. Now this is going to involve spoilers, so if you're in a group where you may be running this, uh, or you know your DM is planning on running this, uh, please don't watch this, uh, you know, and just kind of move on, and you know, after everything's all said and done, you can always come back. So again, spoilers, just want to throw that out there. So, <clears throat> the first individual I want to discuss is Torlin Silvershield. Uh, he's the first one that actually approaches the player characters, and uh, his motivations are pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, he wants to eliminate the guild. He blames the, the guild, the thieves guild that's working in the outer city, for all of the city's ills. But as time goes on, he kind of becomes more and more um, up upset with the fact that the patriarchs, the main nobles uh, of the upper city, um, aren't necessarily recognized as you know being as wealthy or as important as they are. He becomes upset with seeing things like uh, merchants from the lower city, for example, who operate in the wide, 
uh, dressed up in finery uh, that would be fit the actual nobles of the city. So one of the things that he starts to do is he implements a dress code uh, relatively early on in the campaign, dictating that individuals cannot dress above their station, meaning that uh, if, you, if you're uh, just a simple merchant, for example, you shouldn't be dressing in like the finery of nobles. So things like expensive jewelry, silks, furs, should only be worn by actual patriarchs or nobles. Um, as time goes on, he also wishes to see the city watch that operates mainly in the upper city become the main authority. Um, he also wishes to shut off or close off the upper city to people that he doesn't deem to be worthy enough of being in there. So even merchants who would operate legitimately in the wide in the upper city uh, are expected to clear out in the middle of the day when he starts closing the gates down earlier than they normally would. Um, <clears throat> eventually, his uh, despise of the guild and the corruption that he sees them spreading uh, goes on to the actual ruling council itself. He knows that the other two of the, th of the three remaining dukes, him being the third, uh, have been known to have been bought by the guild and have released several um, prisoners that are expected to be part of the guild or uh, in collusion with the guild or sympathizers of the guild. Uh, they've actually pardoned them, released them, and Silver Shield is absolutely sick and tired of that. He wants to restructure the entire government and weed out this corruption. Now, as the influence of Ball grows stronger, his idea actually isn't to just remove them through peaceful or political means. He actually intends to go through drastic measures and um, contracts individuals to create large volumes of what's called smoke powder, or basically gunpowder, black powder, explosives, and wishes to destroy the High Hall while all these nobles, or not nobles, but uh, political leaders are within it. Uh, destroying them, removing their influence, and allowing him to restructure things. So that's his ultimate end goal. Uh, up next is um, uh, Ravenguard, and he is the new leader of the Flaming Fist. He, he took over that role as Abdul Adrian was defeated. Uh, he again wants to institute law and order, and he wants law and order above anything else. He also, too, blames the guild for a lot of the problems in the city and wishes to see them shut down. Uh, as time goes on, this desire goes beyond simply uh, wanting to just have them gone to really wanting to have absolute law and order in the city. Uh, as events unfold, he ends up... Um, rejecting the authority of the ruling council as well as the city watch, knowing that they are corrupt, bought out, and released prisoners even though they should be convicted uh, by the, you know, the laws of the city. To this effect, he begins instituting his own kangaroo courts throughout the city, immediately trying individuals um, of various crimes and carrying out the punishments. Uh, as things kind of escalate to their ultimate um, boiling point, um, he ends up actually imposing public executions in order to try to get people to um, adhere to all the laws. This takes place after declaring martial law at, uh, at one point, to the point where you know, individuals are expected to be uh, inside um, their homes after dark. Uh, large gatherings are not allowed to take place. Uh, the only people you're allowed to actually meet with are family members, but again, that's supposed to take place indoors, and eventually he ends with these public executions. Uh, the last individual is uh, Raelle. So she is a high-ranking member of the guild that operates in the outer city in a place called Little Kalimshim. Uh, the, the goal initially of the guild is to redistribute wealth and to make life better for the outer city citizens who are more or less left to fester. Uh, a lot of the unpleasant businesses like uh, tanners, uh, uh, blacksmiths, a lot of things that would make you know air quality and stuff unpleasant take place in the outer city and the citizens kind of suffer through there. Uh, guards rarely come down and law is not enforced hardly at all. Um, to make things, uh, to progress her goals and the goals of the guild, it starts off with, as I had mentioned in a previous example, the idea of uh, robbing from the nobles of the upper city, robbing from the tax collectors, redistributing wealth. Uh, as time goes on, these small things like robberies, uh, break and enter, start to escalate to the point where the guild begins kidnapping uh, members of noble families to ransom them off. If the ransom is not paid, then these individuals end up being killed. Um, also, the guild starts to promote uh, riots and create mobs that are, you know, to march on the upper city and to protest the injustices that the outer city residents are suffering from. In 
this situation, these go horribly or have the potential to go horribly. Uh, hundreds of people potentially killed as these riots escalate out of control and with you know criminals and uh, hundreds of people locked away in Worms Rock, the main location where the, the jail is that the uh, Flaming Fist oversees. Her ultimate goal is to release all these criminals and create a horrible situation where um, you've got plundering, murdering, and all, all these things to just to destabilize and overthrow uh, these the city officials. So as these events unfold, uh, the player characters have the ability to intervene in certain situations. So they can do things like try to have the, the rules of the dress code relaxed, try to um, you know, overturn the the curfew uh, on citizens or people in the upper city uh, having to be out by a certain time. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, one of the things that Silver Shield does is he legalizes duels again, uh, allowing him or allowing any individual to challenge another to duels, which um, have the potential to end again in murder. And some people do use this as an excuse to kill people that they simply don't like. The player characters can try to intervene in some of these situations. They're not going to be able to take place or take part in everything that occurs. So some of these events are going to unfold. Um, without their ability to intervene. Uh, the final events, so the things like such as the explosion of the the High Hall and the killing of the uh, the council members there, um, the public executions or the, uh, the jailbreak at Worms Rock uh, will take place as the tenth and final stage of the adventure. Now the way that this works is throughout the previous nine stages as events unfold, the player or the, the DM tracks which what takes place and who gains the most favor in terms of what Ball's looking for in his new chosen. Um, the, the two highest ranking individuals have their plans ultimately come through to fruition. So not all three of those last major events will take place unless they all end up being tied for the same number of points. Um, so as, as these major events take place, the, the two, uh, you know, the most likely the two of the three, uh, being like the, again, the explosion, uh, the public executions and the, uh, the jailbreak, uh, after this occurs, the remaining uh, governing uh, or high-ranking officials realize that things cannot continue to go along this way. So they decide to try to negotiate things peacefully and to try to boost morale for the, player, or for the citizens of Baldur's Gate. They have a festival. It's a three-day event that's meant to uh, essentially try to uh, make everybody you know, feel better, try to uh, smooth over all these hostilities and try to move on with, uh, with life. Now at this point, during this festival, uh, the Feast of the Moon, which is the default version that it refers to as, the individual who had the highest number of points uh, for Ball's favor transforms into the Chosen of Ball and attacks this festival in one of three different ways. So, for example, if uh, Russell Rael from the Guild ends up becoming the Chosen, she sends her thugs in as assassins to just start basically killing people. Uh, as this happens, um, the crowd parts, she declares herself the Chosen of Ball, she transforms and starts just attacking anybody uh, around, murdering as many as she can. Uh, if Torlin Silvershield becomes the Chosen of Ball, he actually quietly poisons the wine that everybody's drinking, uh, not to kill them, but to, to, to whip them into this uh, frenzy of aggression where they'll start attacking each other and murdering each other that way. And again, he transforms into the, the Chosen of Ball and the player characters are expected to uh, intervene at that point. The last potential individual is uh, Ravenguard, the leader of the Flaming Fist, and he starts basically launching, uh, like catapulting, uh, missiles and you know different uh, things into the gathering of the crowd. He then sends the flaming uh, fist soldiers in to start again massacring people, where he again transforms into the chosen of Ball, and the player characters are again expected to intervene at that point. So that's basically the way that the adventure is presented, and I like you know a lot of the way that they do things. Now the where it takes place in the city, and there are still laws. The player characters are a bit restricted as to what they can actually do. If they wish to go start taking out these individuals as they start becoming more and more uh, corrupt or more and more evil, they can attempt to do so, but there are consequences for doing that. 
One of the things that's interesting, however, is if the player characters are aggressive enough and murderous enough, they themselves may become the actual chosen of Ball instead of one of the three NPCs. And the adventure does actually have a little bit of information on what to do if that ends up being the case. So that's the, the premise of the adventure, some of the events that unfold during that. Uh, so uh, now that, that overview's out of the way, what I'd like to do is just kind of give my final thoughts on the uh, Murder in Baldur's Gate uh, adventure and campaign guide. So in conclusion, I love uh, Murder in Baldur's Gate. Uh, I think it's one of the best examples of how to do an urban adventure right. It's also a great way of trying to create the sense of a living world where the player characters are privy to events that are going on around them but can't necessarily interfere in or you know solve all the issues that are going on in this massive city. Uh, the one thing I would say is probably a bit of a downside is that it's not the friendliest uh, adventure for new DMs. There's a lot of stuff to keep track of between the uh, Ball's favor points um, you know, and other events that are going on, a lot of stuff that can happen behind the scenes, it, and the fact that it kind of leaves you open to kind of filling in some of the stuff yourself. Um, it's not the geared towards new players or new DMs. Uh, players would probably be fine, but new DMs are going to have a bit of trouble with this. Uh, if you're a veteran DM, however, uh, this uh, adventure structure, I think, is excellent. Uh, it's one of the best written adventures I think I've ever come across, and I genuinely enjoy it. Uh, I can't wait to run it, although I think I've decided on doing a Legacy of the Crystal Shard, which is why I'm actually doing the review for this now, because I didn't want there to be spoilers for anybody that was going to be playing in the game that I run. So at some point in the future, I definitely want to run this. Um, the fact that the, uh, the the adventure comes with a you know 60 some odd page uh, campaign guide that details the city itself is absolutely fantastic. It's a great amount of information and even if you don't run the adventure but you want to use Baldur's Gate as sort of like a hub world or a base of operations, there's so much information in there to let you flesh out the city. Uh, I love seeing locations that I'm used to in like the video games, uh, particularly the Elf Song Tavern, which I really enjoyed from the original Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance game that came out for like the Xbox, PlayStation 2, and uh, the GameCube. So there's a lot of really great stuff there. The statue with uh, of Minsk holding Boo is awesome. The fact that they actually incorporate that into the adventure is itself great. Uh, I also like the fact that you kind of have uh, the three main antagonists uh, slash potential patrons show sort of a, a, a slow descent into madness. I mean, they begin uh, with the clearest of intentions or the purest of intentions for the most part. Silver Shield may be a little bit um, more morally ambiguous to begin with, uh, but it seems like all three of the potential patrons that the player characters can work for um, actually start with pure intentions and then you kind of see them descend into madness. Um, you know, for example, uh, seeing uh, Raven Guard's uh, descent from going from wanting to just uphold justice and the law to getting to the point where he's so sick of corruption and crime going unpunished that he begins public execution. So there's just really cool kind of um, descent there as far as that goes. Uh, I love the fact that it ties into the Baldur's Gate computer games because those games I think are absolutely awesome. Like I said, I was never very good at them and I hadn't beat one until just this year actually. But I love the fact that it follows that story because that's such an iconic story that a lot of people, a lot of, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons veterans are probably going to be familiar with. I think a lot of us have played those computer games. So to pick up and have sort of like the third chapter of that story, uh, in my opinion, is just fantastic. Uh, the DM screen itself is also really great. You know, I love the fact that it has the maps facing outward and inward, so the player characters can always kind of get an idea of where uh, they are in the city, and the DMs have more detailed information on the inside of the screen. Um, I love the fact that the adventure, again, really feels like it's perfect for an urban setting. Uh, the player characters have the ability to kind of move around, do things as they wish, and um, as the events kind of unfold around them, they have to choose which ones they want to go after, which I think is really cool. Um, the only, I think, downside that I can really come up with as far as this goes is the fact that um, you have to do some work with uh, difficulty classes for a lot of the checks and skills that are involved. Uh, you also have to put some work in trying to determine um, how to abdicate things like skill checks to overcome social encounters, because there's a lot of social interaction that takes place in this one. It's not very combat heavy. Uh, which is evidenced by the fact that if you go onto the online PDFs for the uh, statistics for all the creatures, 
Um, the number of pages that Murder in Baldur's Gate has is less than any of the uh, encounters that are labeled in the Legacy of the Crystal Shard. Uh, it's also one PDF that has D&D Next, 4th Edition, and 3.5 statistics all in them. So there, again, it's very combat light. So this is more of a storytelling kind of campaign. That said, when you're trying to get the player characters to negotiate and try to calm down angry mobs uh, or overzealous guards, you know, you have to really look at how you're going to abdicate that. And a lot of them kind of default to having like DC 10 checks for uh, stealth or, you know, intelligence or wisdom. And that's kind of low. I did see, a, I think, at least one DC 15. But I think what you really need to do is uh, consider using higher difficulty classes for, for a lot of these things. Uh, 10 is pretty easy to come by, especially there's one section where the player characters may have to stealth their way around if they're in the upper city at night um, when they're supposed to be out of it. So uh, having a DC 10 uh, dexterity check uh, or stealth check that you know only half the player characters in the party have to actually pass makes it a little too simple. So there are ways to kind of work around that. So as a DM, you're gonna have to put some work in. But that said, it's just, like I said, it's just such a refreshing approach. I mean, to have three different storylines happening all at once, uh, and, you know, letting the player characters know that they are, while they're important, they're not the driving force of the world, and that things are going to happen that they have no control over. So I think that's, that's really great. I think veteran groups especially will find this refreshing. The only other really negative that I can say is the packaging is kind of flimsy. I mean, it's just a thin paper... Uh, sleeve over top of the DM screen and the adventures inside. So I'm really hesitant to actually put this on my shelf vertically because I'm worried about ripping or tearing it, so I have to lay it uh, horizontally. So it would have been nice if it would have come in like an actual folder, uh, something a little bit sturdier. I wouldn't mind the sleeve over top of it, but to have something a little sturdier to hold it in together other than just having the DM screen kind of hold everything inside. But that's really it. That's the only negatives that I can come up with. So I think this is a fantastic adventure. Uh, I really recommend it for especially veteran DMs um, and veteran groups that are looking for something a little different other than where the chosen one and everything revolves around us. Uh, so thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the review. Hope you enjoyed the video. And we'll see you next time. Funding for this channel is provided by the awesome support of my patrons on my Patreon page. And I'd like to provide a special thanks to Kennedy S. and uh, David L. Uh, you guys really help uh, make this possible for me to continue uh, making these kinds of videos. So thank you ev to everyone who contributes. You guys are all awesome. And special thanks to David L. and Kennedy S. You guys rock.